you know, I've been looking forward to this because yeah. ophthalmology wise. We've kind of tried to ignore orthokeratology <laughs> for many, <laughs> many years. and it, it, Why is that, do you think? I, I think we all dismissed it as just an, just an optometry thing, I think. Yeah. Uh, which is very naive of us, really. But I, I suppose, as from speaking from a corneal specialist point of view, yeah. uh, we were quite worried about the risk of keratitis. Yeah. And... We thought, well, you know, it may actually be a, quite hazardous to wear a contact lens overnight because a lot of the studies, you know, for the extended wear lenses yep. have shown that if you wear a contact lens overnight, you increase it's an your risk. risk, yeah. It's about 10 times or something like yep. that. In some of yeah, Fiona Stapleton's work uh, that she did on. Uh, risk of keratitis. Uh, mm -hmm. It's quite alarming, and uh, I suppose to to actually subject the eye to a contact lens, and yeah, like my, as I was saying to you yesterday, my initial impression was that it was a a tight fitting lens that that would mould the corneal epithelium through like physical and, force. Yeah, and yeah. I thought you know wearing a contact lens uh, that's tight and wearing it overnight. And, you know, you may be doing it in, in children as well. Mm. And, yeah, I, I thought, well, that couldn't be a, a good thing, you know, uh, increasing the risks of keratitis. And uh, I suppose the thing is that uh, a lot of people, a lot of people have worn ortho-K lenses now, you know, probably a lot more than the ophthalmology world appreciates because... Yeah. Uh, the ophthalmology world only sees the complications, you know, the the keratitis. Yeah, there's probably a lot more people who actually, you know, wear them successfully. But, you know, obviously if you just see the, you know, the people who have problems or complications associated with it, then, you know, obviously that's that's sort of the view you have, I guess. Um, whereas, you know, people who are doing well in it and don't have any issues, they, you know, you, you probably wouldn't hear of them. Um, but it's amazing um, how many people actually sort of do ortho K and like for whatever reason, whether it is the myopia control or just purely for vision correction. Um, and like it is sort of probably gaining in popularity, probably more so now because of its um, its talk in relation to, you know, control of myopia. But um, yeah, I think we'll probably see more and more people starting to wear it, um, you know, in kids and adults as well, I'd say. It's interesting because, you know, also K has been around for a long, long time. Like mm. uh, I remember John Mountford, uh, he, he must have been doing it, uh, what, 10, 15 years or something? Oh, like I reckon that. probably nearly 20. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's probably been, yeah, I reckon probably between 15 and 20 years. It's Yeah, it's been like, yeah, a lot longer than, you know, what we probably realise, I guess. Mm. And uh, I suppose, you know, we, we've been... Uh, you know, aware of the the case reports of keratitis, and mm -hmm. uh, but really there hasn't been as many as you'd, you'd think. Like if you think of the number of people who are actually using ortho K and the number of cases that are being reported with keratitis, you know, admittedly not every case of keratitis is going to be reported. No, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not not as many as you, you'd uh, what you'd, you'd think. first sort of think. Yeah, mm. and it's interesting that a lot of the like statistics of you know um, keratitis in ortho K, where there was sort of a, a big um, sort of bump in numbers in in terms of incidents related to us like a relatively short period of time in Asia, um, and that was when the when ortho K was quite unregulated in terms of like cleaning and just, you know, who could fit them, um, these like lenses. And so it was probably not so much down to the modality, but just down to, you know, incorrect um, fitting of lenses and incorrect sort of insertion removal techniques and, and cleaning techniques as well. So I think, you know, one of the biggest ways to prevent the, um, the incidence of keratitis is to make you know is patient education to make sure that patients understand what they're doing and how to do it and and obviously having you know practitioners fitting lenses correctly and and safely and then the actual modality itself doesn't necessarily increase your risk of keratitis over any other type of contact lenses which is an interesting sort of thought as well i guess mm. well i suppose we can talk a bit more about that yeah uh 
But, uh, yeah, no, I think ophthalmology really can't ignore ortho K anymore, and it's something that we do have to know a bit more about. So Yeah, I think there's probably going to be more, more and more of a push with ortho K and, and any other techniques that seem to, you know, halt the progression of myopia just in the, you know, in the next few years, I guess, as the myopia um, boom continues on. Mm. So just um, a little bit on myopia, uh, obviously, is a refractive error that causes blurred vision, um, and it's usually due to the elongation of the the globe, um, which then results in light focusing in front of the retina rather than accurately on the retina. It's it used well, I used to sort of think whether myopia was, you know, caused by axial elongation or just um, like a high, highly powered cornea, I guess. So a steeper cornea, but they seem to think it's a lot more to do with just that extra growth of the of the eyeball itself, um, causing myopia development and then progression of myopia as well. The interesting thing with myopia is that the prevalence differs fairly significantly between regions, so d- sort of dependent on where you live, and that can be either like geographical, but also urban versus rural areas, um, and also ethnicity. Sort of the last thirty is is quite a significant increase in the prevalence of myopia and sort of extrapolated data from from research suggests that there's going to be another significant increase over the next um, next sort of 30 years as well up until 2050 um, and we're, we're looking at numbers in um, up to sort of 5 billion people around the world affected with myopia and this obviously has major public health implications for you know, everyone around the world, I guess, um, but particularly in sort of Asian countries where the prevalence is so high and um, it causes such a significant amount of blindness around the world as well. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, it, I suppose myopia, I suppose I talk from the ophthalmological point of view here is that mm-hmm. uh, we've always just regarded, oh, it's, it's just a refractive area, you can wear glasses or contact lenses yeah. or have laser even and it's you, know, you could correct your vision and it you know it should should be correctable to uh, 6 6 or 20 20 vision so yeah. we, we, we've kind of trivialized it in that sense that it, we, we haven't really regarded it as a disease per se yeah uh, well it's interesting when we um you know when we have parents who bring their kids in and it's so important to try and explain to them the importance of trying to slow down the progression um, because a lot of people think the same where they just think oh so what my kid just needs to wear glasses like it's no big deal and you know if if they stayed a minus one maybe it wouldn't be and and maybe even as they became presbyopic they'd sort of prefer it but um, the issue is obviously as the myopic continues to progress that you have all these you know increased risk of Things that cause blindness, and then that's that's where the the issue lies, and and why we actually care about trying to control myopia and either preventing its development or at least slowing its progression if it's already started. Mm. Yeah, well, that, that's the key, I think, that and the ability to slow the myopic progression. You know, that, that's mm. kind of a very new concept, and yeah. Uh, I suppose, you know, we, we've always assumed that, you know, myopia is just an inevit- inevitable thing and, you know, if you, your parents wore glasses and you wear glasses and your children's likely to wear glasses, especially if yeah. you know, both parents wear glasses, mm. uh, that, it, yeah, you just get your glasses and it just gets uh, That's it. <laughs> steadily uh, increased in power until, you know, you, you reach your late teens. And I think traditionally that's just how it's been, hasn't it? Like, you know, you just started out, you know, slightly short-sighted and then you just get new glasses every year. And nowadays with all the research, these, you know, retinal complications and eye health complications related to myopia, there's been a big interest in then what can we do about, you know, getting to that point and whether we can actually stop a child from becoming a minus five or whether we can at least slow it down and prevent them from being a minus eight or something like that. So... Yeah, it's an interesting um, sort of field that's yeah fairly fairly new in development as well. Mm. And that's where ophthalmologists have to get interested in ortho K because mm. if if ortho K truly does slow down the progression of myopia, or uh, if there are other means of slowing down myopia, mm-hmm. uh, 
it, it then becomes prevention of disease. And That's it, yeah. If you can prevent not, not just the refractive error issues, but also the, the risks of, uh, I think we talked about later on, like retinal mm. detachment and tears yep. and myopic degeneration. Uh, if you can actually slow that down, it does become a real uh, entity in terms of uh, a treatment that we need to know about. Yeah, absolutely. So as I was saying um, before, the, the myopia prevalence does vary quite a lot with um, with region and ethnicity. Um, and the other thing is that it has, uh, the prevalence has changed quite significantly over, over time, um, which we can see here. So in Australia in 1999, which was the last data that I could find, but it was um, about you know, 15 to 17 percent of the adult population were short-sighted. Um, and if we have a look at at the US in um, not like the 1970s, there was about a quarter of, of adults who were short-sighted and now there's 40%. So it's a huge increase in, you know, in the last 40 years. Um, in your, some, some of the Asian countries, China, South Korea, Singapore and Taiwan, you've got almost 90% of urban youths who are myopic now. Um, but 60 years ago, only about like, maximum sort of 20% of these um, these, this same cohort were myopic. So again, you know, that's a very significant increase in numbers. And if you think of, you know, potential health implications that come with, you know, higher levels of myopia and obviously more people being myopic, you know, that is going to have, um, you know, big implications for public health systems as well. Um, and this is what they talk about when they say the myopia boom is just, you know, this just um, how how quickly it's increasing in um, in prevalence around the world. Yeah, they're astounding figures, isn't it? Like Australia, I think almost twenty yeah. percent, like one in five people are, are needing refractive correction. Yeah. Uh, you know, US forty percent. That Person, that's, that's seems yeah. like very high. It's it's. Uh, almost every second or third person is going to have refractive error. And then obviously you've got your high probes as well, but it's yeah, it'd be like half half mm. the population are in glasses for whatever reason. But obviously the vast majority of of those people are are short sighted, and you know it's rapidly increasing, you know year to year as well. Mm. Definitely myopia is more prevalent than hyperopia, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah interesting. But, uh, you know, I've, I've certainly been aware of it, you know, being Asian myself, uh, you know, my, my parent, well, my, my father's myopic, my, mm -hmm. um, my brother's myopic, my sister's myopic, uh, my own daughter's now myopic. Yeah. <laughs> but funnily, my son's That's... not myopic. Um, but... Are you, Graham? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably about minus seven or so. Are you um, really? Mm. Yeah. So you wear contact lenses. Wear contact lenses, yeah. Ah. <laughs> um, so that, you know, hence probably my own personal interest in myopia, yeah. Yeah, fair uh, enough. But, yeah, I, I've been looking at the myopia for a long time and it may have been a stimulus for me to become an ophthalmologist, actually, mm. okay. uh, originally. But, uh, you know, I remember getting my first pair of glasses uh, probably in about grade three and I, I remember putting the glasses on and, and just being able to see leaves on trees yeah uh, uh, and yeah you know, I remember even my school work um, in grade one grade two grade three I, I used to wonder why the kid next to me could always do things faster and can see stuff on the on the board you know we had actual blackboards back then uh, and yeah I, I just wonder why I had to copy off the kid next to me because I, I just mm. couldn't see um, and it really wasn't picked up until some sort of school examination that yeah well and it's interesting because as a kid you often don't know you know what the difference is so you just you know that's just how you see and you just manage and do you know do whatever you have to 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 um you know get by but it once you get you know that first pair of glasses it amazing how many people do say like oh wow I can actually see individual leaves on a tree it's not just a green blob or mm. you know they can see detail and you know it's like a high definition view of the world so I mean it's yeah it, it obviously makes a big difference and you know when it comes to to kids which is often when well nowadays when myopia seems to be you know setting in is that they can you know be left behind in school so um, there's education you know issues and and being um 
you know, being slower to copy down work and even with, you know, just following what's going on in the classroom if they can't see very well. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot to think about, I guess, um, just even with screening of kids, um, certainly thinking about family history and risks of myopia and when you, you know, first should see an optometrist to have, have vision checked so that it's not gone, you know, un, um, well, not picked up, I guess, for, for too long. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, that, the cell and charts you show uh, at the bottom of the slide, now, yep. you look at minus 2.5 mm. and I, I think my first pair of glasses must have been like minus 2. So yeah. Uh, I, can, I can now appreciate, you know, how little I was actually seeing for the first three years of my education. Yeah. And uh, it is, it's amazing that, you know, often we do see like the first first time someone will come in for an eye test that they're already like a minus one and a half or a minus two um, because prior to actually starting school a lot of your you know your visual world I guess is sort of within arm's reach or you know it's the TV and you can kind of get closer to the TV um, it's not really until you're sitting in that classroom situation where you you know you might be a few rows back in you know in the rows of desks and you've got to look at the board and that's when you start to think oh hang on I can't see that like you know the kid mm. next to me so mm. Mm. You know, I remember yeah, having progressive increase in my glasses, probably mm -hmm. up till about, I would say, even early 20s, yeah. uh, maybe 20, 21. Yeah. Um, uh, I probably got my first contact lenses uh, probably when I was about 17 or so. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, even after 17, there, there was that slight uh, increase so, yeah, I think that's just the way I thought it is, you know, yep. you have a pair of glasses, you might get contact lenses down the track. Uh, I haven't visited the, the LASIK option yet, but, uh, you know, that's that's just the way it's always been, you know, yeah. it's also okay, it was never in the picture. No. So when we're thinking about myopia, obviously we, you know, we think about the risk factors that can uh, cause its development. And um, for many, many years, uh, like with a lot of things, they look at you know, genetics versus environmental influences. Um, and I guess traditionally they've always sort of thought it was uh, genetic, um, you know, that if your parents were myopic, then, you know, you had a higher risk. And, and that's still certainly the case. I think if you've got one parent who's myopic you've got a 40 percent chance of becoming myopic yourself and if you've got two parents then I think it's about 60 percent so there's there's obviously quite a, a strong influence there in terms of um in terms of genetics but the interesting thing is that we are looking a lot more at environmental factors now as well because the sudden increase or the dramatic increase in uh, the prevalence of myopia can't be accounted for just um, through genes. So, you know, our, our DNA doesn't, I guess, evolve as that quickly to, um, to account for such a, such a significant change in a relatively short period of time. Um, and it's interesting, you know, when you think of the genetic factors um, or the genetic influence, I guess, for myopia, is that they, they'll often, you know, look at identical twins, um, you know, having the same, same DNA. And they have found that there are certainly regions of the genome that are, you know, attributed to the development of short-sightedness. But obviously it's not the, the full picture. Um, my mum is short-sighted, my dad isn't. So obviously I have a, a family history or family risk factor there. But my twin sister is myopic and I'm not. So it's just interesting that, um, that if it was purely genetic, then we should have the same prescription. We should both be equally myopic, I guess, um, but we're not. So there's got to be something else that can explain um, the incidence of myopia, you know, in one, one identical twin and not the other one. So it's, um, yeah, something that I find really interesting is genes and just DNA and genetics and, um, and certainly now looking at, you know, myopia and the influence of both genes and the environment. Um, it's yeah, it's a, an interesting field. Um, they they also did a study a while ago um, of people living in uh, the northern part of Alaska, um, and they had quite changing lifestyles at that time. From you know 
living in isolated communities and then moving into more um, urban areas. And of the adults who were living in these isolated communities, only very few were short-sighted, but more than half of their children became short-sighted. So there's such a big jump from one generation to the next that can't be just explained by genes alone. Go, hmm. <laughs> Lauren, you, you and your sister it could be a whole study in itself, couldn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, we have actually done some twin studies at the Royal Brisbane Hospital Um Oh, it would have been when we were, I don't know, like 10 years ago, probably more, 15 years ago. Um, and that I think it was more on like cognitive type stuff back then. I can't quite remember. But yeah, we, um, but yeah, it's always interesting. And obviously both being in sort of medical fields, you know, we find it quite interesting just what you can find out from twins, I guess, in terms of, you know, having the same, same DNA, but, you know, how different things might affect you differently because of, just other factors, I guess. So, yeah, it's kind of cool. <laughs> but it, obviously you would have spent a lot of time together, especially growing up. Well, we, like... Absolutely. Like, we're so, we're so close even mm. now. And, um, you know, and, I, and I've often thought about, like, when I've been thinking about the, you know, the genetic and environmental debate um, in, say, just with myopia, like, I've thought, you know, what did we do differently mm. in, in terms of our environment? And, you know, I remember that, um, I mean, we did... In high school, we did, which Carly became myopic at about probably 17, so she was, or 16, 17, so she was a late onset myope. But she, um, we studied the same subjects except she did chemistry and I did legal studies. It's interesting, like, is she, yeah. she would be only low myope, though. Wouldn't yeah, she is, yeah. yeah. She's only, um, she's probably, uh, I think she was originally um, maybe slightly over prescribed, which often happens with my, young myopes, but. Mm, yeah. I think now she's probably about a minus one, one, two, five, maybe at the most. Mm. So she's she's fairly low. Like she's not really going to mm. cause her too much trouble, hopefully. That's the most useful level of myopia. You know, by the time she hits 40. Oh, she's going to uh, love it. Yeah, yeah she, she'll be able to read still. <laughs> I'll be so jealous of her then, yeah. Uh, well, just another thought. Like, uh, for instance, my daughter is quite myopic. You know, she, she's 15. And yep. my son, who's two years younger, he is not showing any signs of refractive error. Yeah. Oh, okay. And yep. it's interesting because he, he, from a very young age, he, he took to computer games. And, yeah. you know, he's been playing on close-range computer games. He also does a lot of reading. So he, he does a lot of near work. Uh, he, he would be a more indoors type of kid rather than an outdoors yeah. type of kid so so he's sort of got all the risks like the environmental got all the risk, risk factors he's, yeah. he's got a myopic sister he's got a myopic father he's got myopic grandparents yeah uh, or one grandparent but yeah the, I, I suppose my my wife is is not terribly myopic yeah it's interesting because he does have obviously a few things working against him there but he's um if he's you know still okay and doesn't have any sort of refractive error at this stage then yeah there's obviously there's just so much more to the picture i guess and it's probably going to be hard to pinpoint you know exactly what does cause myopia or whether it really is just a combination of different factors and those combination of factors affect different people differently i guess hmm. well the fact there are so many uh, different genomes involved uh, yeah it indicates that perhaps different genes are susceptible to different environmental influences. Like, yeah. But possibly if you have one particular type of myopia, it's got a high risk factor for DNA inheritance. But yeah. other ones, you know, may have a lower inheritance factor and, and more environmental what? factor. Yeah, yeah well, very true. So this uh, this here is just showing some um, some study data, sh just showing the increase in prevalence um, in younger adults, which you can see on the um, with the the graph there, and it's just a dramatic increase in these Asian countries that are represented. The um, the table also shows just in different age groups um, the increase in prevalence, and we can see that across all the age groups represented there, from you know twelve year olds up to sort of 54 year olds I guess and that's um that's increased for both females and males from the 1970s up until um the t uh, early 2000s so it's you know it's not just kids that it's affecting um we're seeing this increase sort of across the board I guess and it's 
yeah, it's interesting. It seems to be maybe uh, affecting females a little bit more than males as well. It's interesting looking at this graph, though. Like, uh, you, you don't know how accurate, I suppose, if they no. just say it's estimated. But it, it's funny if you look at the Singaporean mm. line, it, it's it's flattened out, you know, from, yeah. for, for, from 1990 to 2010. And you wonder maybe they didn't have any more data or, or is that a real phenomenon? Like they're not so whether whether I don't know whether they had less data or because they're the only ones that sort of really show a bit of a sort of a plateau I guess at the end there. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. You, you wonder you know different investigators survey different populations and and yeah it's it, possible you can't survey everybody obviously. No. Yeah, but it, it's interesting they they choose Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore. You know they're they're more in the southern Asian region. Uh, South yep. Korea obviously uh, is more north, mm -hmm. and you know if you looked at say Japan, China, and yep. it, you know obviously China's a big country, and the, the, there's a difference between southern China and northern China. Mm. Like as you get more north in China, you get less myopia. Yeah. Uh, if you say compare Guangzhou to Beijing, yeah, the the numbers of people wearing glasses for myopia are, are quite reduced, and yeah. you know also in in Japan, the, probably that they have, uh, I, I would suspect less myopia. And yeah. Certainly in this South Korea, that you know that they seem to have probably in the early days, you know. Yeah, yeah, less myopia before 1990. You know, maybe South Korea is trying to catch up here. Yeah. But yeah, and, and then if you go more north again into Russia, you know, uh, obviously you, you got a different gene pool there. Yeah. And I suspect their rates of myopia uh, are much lower are less, again. Yeah. Yeah.